Good morning, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to Sunrise Extra, our live streaming after show. We have a fun conversation this morning. I love arts and culture, and that is one of the things that I have missed the most during this pandemic is getting out to see a concert or a show. And we have such a vibrant art scene here in the Portland area, so we're all missing it. And we have this morning to talk more about the impact of all this. Andrew Racinos, he is the president of the Tessitura Network. So I know you can do it way better than I can, but can you tell everybody who's listening and watching um, what exactly Tessitura does? Sure, absolutely, Brenda. Um, Tessitura, we're a nonprofit, and we are uh, a nonprofit that is uh, based in the U.S., but we're a global company uh, serving about 700 arts and cultural organizations around the world. And, and what we do is we provide technology and services and community for those organizations. So if you've ever purchased a ticket here at the Symphony or at Portland Center Stage um, or at a museum, uh, chances are uh, that that's that has probably come through our system. If you ever made a donation to a to a symphony or to an opera or to a ballet company, chances are that's going through our system as well. And so we help connect audiences uh, to the art. Andrew, I know when I first came across you, because I just got done um, this morning, as a matter of fact, finishing up a three-part series with you about the arts in Portland, and you got on my radar because of a very, very poignant Facebook post. Um, it was something else. I just kind of got choked up, and I know you got lots of response to it, but for people who haven't seen it, can you tell us a little bit more about what you wrote and why? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I am the president of this company, but I am first and foremost a lover of arts and culture, uh, and I'm a lover of arts and culture in Portland. And I had, had taken a long walk. It was a beautiful day in Portland a couple of weeks ago, one of these great, lovely days that um, Rod's been telling us about. Um, and I walked and I, I kept walking past all of these performing arts organizations, and I just started taking pictures of all of the signs on their doors that said, we're closed um, and, and we'll be back. And it was around the same week that I think that we, that Portland entered phase one. So the coffee shops were opening up and the restaurants were opening up and, and some of the retail was opening up with social distancing and masks and everything. But I, I was starting to feel the first glimmer of sort of a return to normalcy for so many of our businesses in the city. And it made me really, really suddenly extremely sad to know that performing arts because of the close proximity that people have to sit in in order to experience most performing arts that they weren't going to be opening anytime soon, that they are largely in phase three, uh, which is mo probably months and months away. Yeah. Um, so I wrote a post about that because I felt like, you know, I live this every day because it's my business, but a lot of folks don't realize, I think, that that even as other businesses open up, your, your performing arts organizations are going to have to remain closed for the safety of, of everyone around them. And I happen to know because I work in the industry and I have many friends who have been laid off or furloughed or have lost their jobs, um, that this is incredibly difficult time for those people who, who work in this industry. Um, so I just wrote, I wrote the Facebook post. I kind of dashed it off, to be honest. It was sort of a, a primal Yelp <laughs> of yeah. sorts, just saying, you know, as, as things start to come back, just keep an eye on performing arts because those folks aren't, aren't doing so well and they might need your support. So what are some of the, the actors, the people involved in... Um the performing arts, what are they telling you? I mean, we have so many people out of work in so many different industries, kind of, and we've, you know, we've touched on restaurants and we've touched on, um, you know, so many other facets of life, but this is kind of, you know, we've been deep diving into the performing arts. What are people involved saying about, you know, mentally, how are they doing um, without being able to work, without being able to let that creative energy out as well? Yeah, thank you for, for asking that, uh, Nina. It, it's, I mean, yes, everybody has been impacted and, and we're not the only industry and, and, and restaurants. I mean, every travel, it's been incredibly hard for everyone. Um, and so there's, there's a great deal of sort of shared empathy around that. We're all in this together. From the performing arts perspective, um, if you know any kind of an artist, you know that it is their passion and it is their life to be able to work and to be able to share that. And you've probably seen the videos of people even here in Portland who are opening their win you know, op opera singers opening their windows and giving impromptu concerts. Um, and that really isn't sort of a PR thing. It's because they're, they're just bursting to share their art 
Um, I, I work with an organization in Austin, Texas that has been paying their, some of their opera singers to come in and just live stream a couple times a week. One, to help give them some, something, you know, some, some revenue, um, but also just to give them work. Um, they're missing that work. And the reality is because of the way that the virus works, not only in the audiences, you know, social distancing is a problem, but if you think about what's happening on stage, singing, acting, dancing, mm. you know, it's a lot of spit and sweat mm -hmm. and, and close quarters on stage. It's not safe. It's not safe on stage any more than it's safe in the audience. What's the actual response that you, I mean, if someone is hosting a virtual, I don't know, concert of, of singing or like a one, one man show or something, I mean, are people clicking that? Or are they paying to watch? Like what kind of views are you actually um, seeing on some of these performances? Is it working? Um, it, as far as delivering culture to audiences, it is absolutely working. Um, you know, there are almost every cultural organization, including certainly the, the uh, sort of the anchor institutions here in Portland are doing this in, in various ways. Um, you know, the symphony has a program right now that's dedicated to essential workers. Um, so yes, even if it's just a, a solo pianist or a violinist or a dancer, people are clicking. Um, or for orchestras that have uh, recordings of past performances, they're, they're bringing those out of the archives and they're showing them, you know, live. Uh, and, and they're getting huge hits on those. Like, people are definitely thirsting for this. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is it's, 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 they're starting to find that there's a way, and some, some of these organizations are starting to monetize it. They're starting to have you pay. You know, it's not the same as, you know, it's perhaps not as expensive as a concert ticket, but mm -hmm. 10 or $15, the Boston Symphony actually just um, uh, released Tanglewood Online, which is this, this massive program uh, where you can participate in, in their music uh, remotely. Um, but that, and, and the other interesting thing that hopefully will come out of this as a new thing is that they're finding that the interaction that you can have, like you're having right now on Facebook Live where, where people can comment or, or like or, or anything else, uh, is adding a different dimension to the art, which is kind of neat. Okay. So if you think about, if you're sitting and watching a, let's say a small chamber performance with a pianist on stage and there's 200 people in the audience, those 200 people can't be chatting with each other during the performance right or they can't be you know clapping in the middle of a you know a moment that they really yeah. liked but online you can absolutely hit the heart button right so all of that is good the downside is that it, it doesn't bring in near you know it brings in a fraction of the money if anything mm -hmm. to these organizations they can't survive on that by and large um it's great to make sure that they stay in the public eye and that mm -hmm. people still know that they're creating the work but fiscally it's it's not going to pay the rent as well so um, on our KGW Facebook page and then on my personal Facebook page, I uh, posted the question, what is your favorite show? I know you're a culture file. So Andrew, I'll start with you. Um, do you have a favorite show that you have seen here in the Portland area that is like just at the top of your all time list? There is. Uh, my favorite show of all time is go back and forth is West Side Story. Oh, good one. Um, yeah, so West Side Story, music by Bernstein, lyrics by um, Stephen Sondheim, uh, dance by Jerome Robbins. It's in that period of time in the 1950s, they, they all three of them were at the top of their game. Um, and it's just an, you know, an incredible marriage of, of all of those things. I, I hedged because actually there is a good chance that Hamilton is, is sort of knocking that out I of the top spot I haven't seen either of these, but I, I just saw Hamilton is streaming oh. on Disney Plus and we have Disney Plus and I, Brenda, you just watched it, right? We just watched yeah. it over the 4th of July. I highly recommend it. It is I can't just wait. amazing. Yeah. Um, mine, Nina, is Phantom of the Opera. The soundtrack to that, I never get tired of it. I can listen to it over and over and over again. Do you have one? Me? Yeah. Um, I have seen Phantom of the Opera, loved it, and I knew the whole CD. My parents went and saw it when I was a kid, <laughs> and I like had the CD on in my room, and I knew all the words, but I'd never seen the, you know, the actual performance, so I went and saw it um, here at the Keller, and it was fabulous. I saw Cats. Um, as I didn't a get kid. cats. I should have known more the about movie. the fact that it was based yes. on no, even the play, the T. S. Eliot poem. I'm like, what the heck is a jellical cat? 
<laughs> not my favorite. As a kid, I just saw little cats <laughs> going across the stage, and I thought it was great. Um, no, but I would love to get out more, and I need to do that more. Um, and see more performances live because they I've, I went on Broadway in New York and I've seen um, Jersey Boys and um, Wicked and nice. those were really fun to go I mean just the New York you know being there in Times Square and seeing all the theaters is just so fabulous so you, know, Andrew, you have oh go ahead oh no I was gonna say you have a little one at home Paloma so Andrew there are lots of things that parents eventually um, can take their kids to start them young yeah. right Absolutely. You know, here in town, Oregon Children's Theater, um, Northwest Children's Theater, um, you know, most of uh, the, certainly the Oregon Ballet Theater has a whole ballet school mm -hmm. for if, if your little ones are interested in dancing. And a lot of those kids end up uh, in the Nutcracker, you know, the, the, I was the, in that move up program, through the ranks. Yes. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, in the Oregon Ballet Theater. I was a little uh, bonbon in the <laughs> Nutcracker as a kid. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's amazing, and it really is for all ages, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, and, and what the arts and culture folks will tell you is that if you start your kids young, I mean, first of all, all kinds of studies show that if you've got music or dance or art or theater in your life at a young age, it, it helps your SAT scores. It helps you become more creative and innovative mm -hmm. as you grow. Um, but it also creates a lifelong learning uh, and, and love for, for the art forms. Um, so a lot of those bonbons end up going to see Wicked on Broadway, right? Or they burn out and just take up tennis or something, Andrew. That's what happens. No, 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 no. I wish I would have. I would have been a lot stronger and more muscular than I am now. Um, let's talk about, I have a, a friend that loves, loves, loves the Portland Opera. She buys season tickets um, every year. Obviously, you know, not happening this year. But I was wondering, like, if, so if this season, you know, not happening, does that financially affect, does that money really like play into the next season of shows for, you know, symphony or opera or anything mm -hmm. like that? Does it kind of carry over? Well, the carryover is, I mean, so technically you're paying for, you know, when you buy a ticket, that, that money is mm -hmm. being restricted for the, the show that mm -hmm. you're seeing. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, not to get into generally accepted accounting principles right. here this morning, but. Um, so technically not, okay. but the thing that is important to know about that, well, first of all, donations are, are a different story, but the, the important thing to know about that is um, you will see it at these organizations that, like you just talked about your friend who loves the opera. Uh -huh. if, they, if they purchased a ticket or a, hopefully a subscription, which is a series of tickets last year, and then they're not purchasing tickets this year, there is now that risk that they've sort of gone on and, and become interested in other things. And when the opera comes back, the opera's gonna have to spend time sort of re reminding them that they're there, reminding them that they have been a subscriber. So when you see these, you know, all of this work that's, and the opera's doing great at this, like like staying out in, in, in on top of, of, of sort of the, the public eye, making sure, hey, we're still here, here's some past recordings, those sorts of things. It's so you don't forget about them, so they don't have to spend all that money getting you back. Uh -huh. um, and then the other thing that, you know, I mentioned this in the, in the recording that you saw, for these organizations, and it depends on the organization, but anywhere to 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 percent of their income, maybe even 90 percent comes from ticket sales. And when all of those ticket sales have evaporated, you suddenly have, you know, you, you suddenly have all of these folks who you can't pay, you know, so you have to lay them off. Mm -hmm. um, you have perhaps new things that you were trying to do, new productions that you wanted to launch that you can no longer fund because that money helps fund that. So there's a whole ecosystem that breaks apart when suddenly you have to be closed for six or 10 or 12 yeah. months, which is something that frankly, you know, is unprecedented um, for, for this industry uh, that any of us can remember in our lifetime. You know, I think people do forget as well, maybe you can speak to this, that the performing arts, because it's such a pleasure for us to watch, it's a fun weekend thing to do in a lot of instances, this is a profession that people have spent hours perfecting and, you know, years going to school for practicing their craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there is a, you know, I, I love student theater, you know, like high school productions or, or middle school productions. Um, but obviously, there's quite a different level when you go to see something at the Keller or you go to see something at the Broadway Rose out in Tiger, right? Um, this, these are professionals. They've gone to school for this. Um, just like somebody who's a professional lawyer or doctor or surgeon, um, 
there is an incredible amount of talent and hard work that goes into this to create these wonderful weekends um, and to create these life-changing moments. And you know, this is something that I work in in particular in my business. When you saw Hamilton over the weekend, for instance, you, know, you saw the, those incredible actors and singers and dancers on stage, but there were probably 10 to 20 times that many people behind behind the scenes right. you know whether it was literally the stage hands or the ushers or the people who were selling those tickets or the people who were creating that marketing or the people who were going out and doing all of the logistics of the tours i mean the actual industry itself 4.6 million americans work in this industry the vast number of those folks actually aren't on stage they're the ones who are supporting it so just like as, as we're as i'm speaking with both of you i'm sure there's a whole army of folks who are helping put this you know, this morning on, for instance, it's no different than the performing arts. Yeah. So when when this reopens eventually, when we hit phase three, what do you think is, you know, uh, let's take a play, for example. What is that yeah. going to look like? I mean, we, we've been using the Nutcracker example. Are you going to have the Mouse King and one henchman instead of, you know, the whole role <laughs> and like one sugar plum fairy and one other dancer? I mean, are they going to have to significantly pare down performers literally on stage and then you know what what could the audience look like is it every other seat like airplanes are trying to do sometimes what do you kind of foresee yeah it's i mean this is uh this is a a question that is is just you know sweeping the entire industry <laughs> yeah. right now, as you would imagine um so first of all i hope that they open before stage three that is that is where you know it, it that is sort of the, the worst case scenario and when you look at the what the governor has lined up it says, you know, mass gatherings have to wait until that. Um, there will be smaller sort of chamber. I'm already starting to see some of the clubs, for instance, are going to be opening up with some social distance. So rather than packing 100 people into the club, maybe there'll be, you know, 20 people in the club and then the rest of it is live stream, sort of a hybrid. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about hybrid. So you have some people who can go and mm -hmm. be there physically and have that experience. And then the, the bulk of them are seeing it online. It actually makes great financial sense, right? Of like you pay maybe, you know, less than a seat price to view it at home if you have, you know, a, an immuno, you know, compromised issue or something, but you still, I mean, gosh, that would open the door to, there's a lot of issues of, you know, like yeah. privacy protection and um, just, you know, like not being able to stream it to large groups of people who aren't paying for the ticket. But yeah. boy, that would open up a lot of worlds if you could kind of do both. It's like what schools are talking about, you know, the hybrid. Yeah, and then and then once, fr frankly, once there's a vaccine, um, to your question about the, the Mouse King, it, it would hopefully be back pretty much to normal. Um, yeah. You know, that, that you are, you know, the herd immunity or whatever you want to say has, has gotten to the point that we're okay. Um, I don't think anything's ever going to be back to normal, to be honest, but I think the experience itself should be able to come pretty close back to normal. There's been a lot of talk about can we do social distance seating in theaters um, every other row or, you know, six feet around people. And as a technology company, we've been asked to sort of come up with how to sell tickets that are socially distanced, right. which is a conversation I never thought we would have to have. But my, my personal feeling is that, um, and I'm seeing this out in the world, that these are create, you know, these are, this is the original creative class in a way, and they're being very creative mm -hmm. about how to solve this problem in the near term. Um, and I think it's going to show us, it's going to lead the way to some really interesting things in the world. I mean, the pandemic really has shown us so much on every level. But when it comes to the performing arts, I mean, I can't wait to get back into a crowd. I used to be like, oh, it's too crowded in here, let's get it. But no, now I'm <laughs> like, yes, let's get together. Um, I think when people as well, sometimes there are some misconceptions about the performing arts, kind of hoity-toity, you know, maybe you think opera and symphony and you're like, well, that's not really my thing. But there are so, it's such a wide range of things. Um, I think of things like all the cool artists that keep Portland weird. Can you just talk about the diversity in the types of things that we get to do that fall under that performing arts umbrella? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I think Brian Eno, if you know the, the musician and producer Brian Eno, basically said that you know arts and culture is everything that you don't have to do. Mm. It's probably such a wonderful way to put it. Yeah. Um, so the, this is just literally the human expression um, of creativity. So so yes, we started with sort of what they call the anchor institutions here in, in the city, the ballet and the symphony and the opera, um, the museum. But 
independent artists are doing some of the most creative work that you'll see anywhere, whether it is street art, whether it is burlesque shows, um, you know, buskers on Hawthorne Avenue. Um, there is this wonderful ecosystem from individual artists applying their trade all the way up to the, the major institutions that are working on, you know, at, at, at a national or a global level and everything in between. And I think the, the most interesting and successful organizations are the ones that really think about how to integrate all of those areas um, or integrate the different forms. Um, I mentioned this before, but it's I, I just I loved it so much. My daughter is a huge fan of Leica, the film studio here, mm -hmm. and she's memorized every single one of their films, <laughs> unbelievably creative. Um, and they happen to have incredible um, scores. Uh, so the music, like the film score mm -hmm. behind behind Leica. And they, for the 10th anniversary of, 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 of the release of Coraline at the Schnitzer Auditorium, the Oregon Symphony performed the score with the film, this huge screen in front of them. Um, and I loved it for so many reasons. One of them being, I, I go to the symphony a lot, but the audience for this one was completely different. It was a younger audience. Um, it was a much more diverse audience. Uh, and everybody loved every bit of it. They loved the film. They loved the music. Um, they loved feeling, you know, there's nothing like feeling a symphony really mm -hmm. go to town and, and that big hall in the Schnitz and being able to have that moment, sort of the swell of that music with the swell of what was going on in the on the film all at once was really magical. Is that the way that, because a lot of, you know, younger people, it's the same with, you know, TV newscasts. We're trying to constantly innovate and reach, you know, younger audiences and change the way we have done things for decades mm -hmm. to be more current and more, um, you know, inviting. Is that what uh, groups like the symphony and opera have to do is, I mean, you, you mentioned start kids young, but kind yeah. of think of new mediums almost or new ways of, giving their beauty and their product to a different group of young people. Absolutely. Um, the number one word you hear in these discussions in arts organizations is relevance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to, to your point, Brenda, you talk about hoity-toity. There is absolutely this uh, stereotype of the symphony isn't for me because it's for, you know, rich, rich people who are wearing their pearls and, you know, driving up in their limos. Uh, but the reality is, you know, the symphony, for instance, their their composer in residence is Gabriel Kahane, who's a um, who's a pop artist who is writing incredible orchestral work for them now. Mm -hmm. um, opera, uh, the Portland Opera. I don't know if you've seen it, but they have a, a basically a, a food cart that they send around to the yeah. to the festivals, and, and instead of it being a food cart, it opens up and it's a little stage, and there's an opera singer who, <laughs> who sings arias. Um, the Portland, I think it's Opera Opera to Go. I think is what it's called. Oh, but love it's it. Fabulous, like they're. They are trying. They are doing a, I think, a really admirable job mm -hmm. of taking these timeless art forms and, and making them relevant for today. Okay, last question because I know we have to let you go. But for people who are looking at this and saying, "I want to get involved. I want to support the arts during this really critical time," where can they find more information? Um, it's actually really easy. Um, the The fact of the matter is. You know, 40 to 60 percent of, of this industry is out of work right now, including you know, tens of thousands of people in, in this city, in this, in this state. Um, if you have enjoyed any of these, if you've been to the opera or the ballet or or your favorite club um, or to the Confrontation Theater or to Mil Milagro, any of those, just type their name into the website and the word donate and hit, you know, into Google and it'll pull up a it'll pull up their website. They all have a donation link. Click on the link. Um, give them a little money. Um, or give them a lot of money if you've got it. Uh, there, there's nothing that, that could help more right now if yeah. you can. Yeah. Um, and if you can't, support them on online. You know, they mm -hmm. are all streaming. They're they're all you know on YouTube and on Facebook Live and go and like their pages because that also helps keep them in the public eye. As you I've bet. said. All right, Andrew Racinos with the Tessitura Network. Thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us on Sunrise Extra. Oh, thanks so much for having me. That will uh, do it for us this morning. Have a great day, guys.